everybody. So we're so excited. We are here to do a special best of 2017 uh, superlative podcast. Uh, some of these are the same categories that you have at the Oscars and some are just for fun and they should probably have them at the Oscars. It would make it more fun. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> so my friend Conrado is here to do this with me. You want to introduce yourself and of course, I am right here. I am um, ready to go through all of these categories and very excited to be here. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Well, thank you. First topic that we're going to talk about, I divided up instead of just a best of the year, we have a best blockbuster and a best indie. So let's talk uh, the best blockbuster uh, for you. And we're not doing, we're just going to try to do one for most of these. And that, which makes it a lot harder. <laughs> um, yeah. But for me, my best blockbuster, it should be no surprise to anybody, was Wonder Woman. And I think there's a lot of reasons why this was my favorite. But the main reason is because I it felt so emotionally true to me. And I, I, I understand that the CGI gets kind of wonky in the third act and the villains could be better. But I guess I kind of, I kind of expect villains to not be that great in movies now. I don't know. So it doesn't really bother me that much. And I just felt so connected to her character. And uh, I, I really felt like it was sort of, there was sort of a spirituality to it for me that, that felt like a, almost a godlike character that was sort of coming to terms with the frailty of man and how, how we are so quick to be cruel to one another and and how devastating that was for her and so I, I really just emotionally connected with that journey that she went on and that patty jenkins took us on and and for me the no man's land scene is just a moment of film that i will never forget and i i just it was amazing to me and uh i just uh, the first like two times i saw it in the theater i i'm not exaggerating i was weeping like not just crying i was like just it just felt emotionally true to me and so uh i loved it and so that's my favorite blockbuster of 2017 i think that's a great choice um definitely feels like there's been just a couple movies i think that truly felt like events like movies that everyone was talking about this year mm -hmm. and one of them was definitely Wonder Woman and definitely the movie of the summer the one that people were talking about and and truly one of the few movies this year was a really fun really entertaining really good and also uh, you know a blockbuster of the kinds that we want more of and you know with a, with a lot of substance to it and with a lot of things to say I, I thought Wonder Woman was a, was a great movie. Um, it could have easily been my blockbuster pick. Um, I had a feeling that you were going to pick it, so I decided to go in a different direction just mm -hmm. to shake things up a little bit. And the one I want to talk about is another movie that I felt was a good sort of blockbuster of the kind that we don't get a lot anymore, that was really inventive with a lot of great uh, set pieces and some interesting things to say as well about its themes and that is a movie that sadly was did very poorly at the box office valerian and the city of a thousand planets mm -hmm. is my pick um and just like wonder woman you know you say that the third act there are a lot of uh, problems with it and it's definitely the weakest part of the film i think valerian also has a very clear weak spot which is the main character at performance given by one Dane DeHaan which mm -hmm. I think is a terrible terrible miscasting um uh, he just doesn't fit the role of a like you know a cool swashbuckling space hero yeah you know, I don't know exactly what they were thinking there but the rest of the movie so inventive so original and so you know it felt old-fashioned in a very very exciting way and very earnest about all of its emotions yeah yeah i agree i think it was definitely 
one of the most underrated films of the year and i for some reason it seems like with sci-fi we it's sort of like that we only appreciate dead artists <laughs> Not, not, not living artists i feel like it's the same way with sci-fi films we only appreciate them you know after it's been 20 years or something like that because uh i don't think that any of valerian's flaws are really any different than any other heralded sci-fi classic i mean i <laughs> I really Star don't. Wars and him, him is yeah. what everybody is thinking of. <laughs> yeah, well, Star Wars, even Star Trek movies that people yeah. love. I, I don't think uh, that, I don't know, just even The Fifth Element, uh, Luc Besson's, you know, the people love that movie. And I, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I think that, uh, I, I, I thought it was a really fun ride. I enjoyed, I, I liked the fact that I saw something new that I had never seen before. Like, the uh the hall the um hologram uh um, oh yes the scene in the market where, market, where yeah, that's the, the that sort of parallel universe market that's mm -hmm. really cool yeah they're really cool and and uh you know, it, the initial sort of scene where they're they're running and you just go through it's pretty amazing you just go through one uh set piece kind of after another after another and it's just dazzling and i thought that like rihanna i actually thought that whole plot line really worked and had emotion and i agree I, with that i thought she she did a pretty good job and um mm -hmm. yeah um i think i mean one of the great things about the movie is that it's so full of so many ideas right and then like every mm -hmm. second every scene you get something else something new something cool um but maybe it's a little too uh you know forthcoming about all of its enthusiasm and its corniness that i think maybe that's what kept some people at bay and creating because people say they want original films but they don't really they 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 want formula films which i'm not that's fine i love formula films too but uh it's a uh, it's just i don't know just frustrating i like both <laughs> both okay. so all right well so speaking of original films so we're gonna talk about the best indie film and uh, this to me was a year for indie films. Uh, I had almost on my top 10, I had almost all, I, I think I had eight indie films <laughs> in my top I 10. I think it was especially good year for American independent movies. Mm, yeah. It was a really good year. And for, for animation, it's no question. Like it was, the year of in of indie and anime uh that was very strong uh but for me my favorite indie film of the year was personal shopper and uh this was um my first movie from this director and mm -hmm. olivier sas yes and okay. i've heard that his other films are even better but you know, so I'm really excited to see them, but I don't know. This is a film that for me, I totally get if some people think it was boring, but for me, it's just a movie I could watch a hundred times and get something new out of it every time. I think that it has like a huge heart to it where she's dealing with, you know, the loss of her twin brother, which would be devastating and trying to put together, you know, the, the pieces of these experiences that she's having. And so it becomes kind of, you know, on one level it's a mystery and you're trying to figure out you know is, is she crazy is she is this really happening what's going on and uh and and then it also has some thriller elements because you've got this person like stalking her with the text messages and and uh it's just a movie with lots of layers that and i i just i just loved it i thought it's a great movie i think it's a great choice as well um it's a very, I guess, spiritual movie, mm -hmm. but also very up for interpretation, like you say. So I say it's very fitting what you say about watching it many times and getting something different out of it. Just thinking about it, I've only seen it twice, but just thinking about uh, the movie, I start to think about everything that happened and what it means. It's a, it's a very interesting movie, mm -hmm. not just while you're watching it, but you know, thinking about it afterwards. Mm -hmm. which I think it's a great quality mm -hmm. uh, 
for a good film. Yeah, and on my work, best of the year, one of my friends said, said, oh, it was too, it was very vague. And I was like, yes, that's, <laughs> that's right. It's great. Yeah, it's part of the, part of the, um, the allure, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Is your indie of the... Well, um, like you, my list of favorites is full of independent movies, especially American independents. Uh, like I say, mm-hmm. I think it's been a great year for American indies. Um, some of these movies, uh, for some of these categories, I've decided to go with the picks that I think uh, most people might have not heard of or okay. that I feel people are not talking about so much. So, of course, mm-hmm. I love Lady Bird. is my favorite movie of the year. But, you know, um, we have talked a lot about Lady Bird as a culture. I think it's been great in the box office. It's probably going to get it. Oscar nominations and all that. So yeah. I wanted to take a look at uh, what I thought was the most independent film on my list. And that is a movie called Princess Sid, mm. directed by Stephen Cohn. Um, he's a director based in Chicago. And this is a movie, it's a very small movie, uh, but lovely, about this um, girl who goes... Uh, to spend the summer in Chicago with her aunt, who is a writer. And it's sort of like this story about the two women sort of, you know, they haven't spent a lot of time with each other during her childhood because uh, her mother died, you know. And uh, so her aunt and she have like met, but they haven't really spent so much time together. So over this summer, it's, I think the movie takes place over a week or two and they mm-hmm. just like get to know each other and they have these very different personalities and everything. It, this sounds a little hokey, but it's done in such a lovely mm-hmm. way. It's a movie about, you know, just sort of the, the little things about life. And it's a movie that it's very uh, focused on just like, plants and food and the sunlight and all of these things that we sort of take for granted but that make life so interesting and it's about these two women sort of getting to know each other and learning from each other in these very small ways but it's a it's a lovely movie I gotta say just like you with Wonder Woman I sort of just kind of wept through it just because it was so beautiful from the beginning I was just so overwhelmed with how lovely everything was Uh, again it's called princess sid and it's available to stream in a lot of platforms you can rent it on vimeo which is what i did or i think it's also available in amazon and in a couple others itunes for sure so i would definitely recommend it it's a beautiful movie uh yeah i I definitely since you've talked about it i i definitely am gonna gonna watch it for sure because it sounds really good um, so, okay. So next, uh, we have up is best animation. This is one we definitely have a different opinion on, but that's cool. Um, so for me, my best animation, my favorite movie of, of 2017 was Coco. Uh, I just loved it. I was totally emotionally engaged with it. I loved Miguel as a character. I loved Hector as a character. I thought it was devastating in the scene where like he's, trying to uh talk to grandma coco and trying to you know get her to to uh you know to help hector you know and and i thought the animation was gorgeous i loved it i thought the music was great remember me i think is one of the lopez's stronger songs i really liked it and I don't know. I just loved it. Um, yeah, I think you know that I have my issues with Coco, but this uh, podcast is about celebration, not, yeah. you know, I'm not here to tear anyone <laughs> apart. <laughs> uh, not that I would. I think it's a pretty good movie. Um, I just have some issues with it. Um, but um, I don't know. Is there something else you want to say about Coco? Maybe about the year in animation before I, I go on um, to my pick? No, yeah, I mean, if I was going to say my favorite indie, uh, well, I really loved an anime called A Silent Voice. That was beautiful. And then another one that made my top 10 is called A Girl Without Hands, which is pretty amazing because it was literally made by one guy in his house. <laughs> which I just think wow. it's amazing amazing that in uh 
2017 that can happen and it and it was really good too it was beautiful and uh it had used music beautifully and had this flow and it told this uh brothers grim story and so that would be a more subtle one i i but yeah with coco i just emotionally connected with it and i thought it was uh i thought it was really beautiful uh it probably is up there in my um in my pixar rankings fairly high i i haven't decided exactly and i'm gonna do a i haven't reviewed it on my blog yet i did review it on my channel but i i'm I'm going to do one of my, cause I try to, when I review Pixar to really go in depth and I just haven't had time to do it, but I'm going to, and I'm excited to do that. Um, I think, uh, if you connect with the emotion, uh, I mean, I'm one of those people that think that the, there's too much plot to Coco. There's too and maybe predictable as well, but I mm -hmm. think it's uh, thinking back on it. It's not, that much different from some other Pixar movies that I like. I think there was just something about the emotional arc that I just couldn't mm -hmm. fully get there. And that's the thing yeah. that's holding me back. Um, Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, so what was your favorite? <clears throat> My favorite, you will be happy to learn, is not the boss baby, <laughs> even though I did like it. Um, my favorite, also pretty close is the move to my favorite is the movie that we talked about in this very podcast, The Breadwinner. Mm -hmm. That is definitely my runner up. But in the last few days, I just caught up with, uh, so this is a little bit of a cheat because it's a short, but it's uh, World of Tomorrow episode two, the uh -huh. version of other people's thoughts. So speaking of uh, people making a movie on their own, alone in their apartment, I'm pretty sure that's how Don Hertzfeld did yeah. it for this uh, movie. Even though it's a short, only 22 minutes and also available to stream on Vimeo like Princess said, mm -hmm. um, a sequel to a short from a couple years ago called World of Tomorrow, which is, uh, in my opinion, a perfect movie. I think World of Tomorrow is so great and it's so unique and uh, so much so that when I heard that he was doing a sequel, I have said, well, there's no way this is going to be as good as the original. And it isn't, but it's pretty close. It's in it's actually surprisingly close and I take my hats off because um, it is, I mean, obviously some of the surprise of just exactly what the movie was that I had with World of Tomorrow isn't there because we know the characters now. Mm -hmm. um, but it's basically this sort of psychedelic story about this girl who is visited by, by a clone of herself from the future who is coming to uh, sort of get her memories so that she can be herself almost. It's so, you know, very trippy, um, very surreal, very weird sort of stick figure mixed with weird video animation. Um, talks about sort of the future, memory, death, philosophy. It's a very dense movie for 22 minutes. Um, mm -hmm but it definitely goes in a weird ride that not like Coco ends up having a lot of a very emotional payoff, I think, at the end, talking about sort of generations and love and, and uh, friendship people. I don't know. It's, it's, I love Don Herbstfeld's work. I think he's a very original animator. I think he... Uh, everything he does is interesting. And I think this sequel to World of Tomorrow is very, very cool. I wonder if he's going to make a third or fourth one and where he might go because, um, you know, it's a lot of, it's a world that's open to science fiction, crazy interpretations. Yeah. yeah. Have, you, have you seen it? I did. I've seen it only once. And I have to admit, Don Hertzfeld kind of makes me feel stupid sometimes <laughs> because... <laughs> I don't quite get it 100%. I'm not going to lie, but I uh, but I admire it and I think it it's uh it's beautiful and I enjoy it. I mean, I I don't know, like I I don't quite understand like what the point he's trying to make or what exactly is going on. I think, <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> yeah. Um but I think that's almost part of the appeal. So I uh, um, I don't think you yeah. should like feel dumb or anything about 
not getting it. I, I, if you read what he uh, sort of like the brief description that he puts along the video on Vimeo, uh, you can see that he, the, the, these shorts are just like the result of him recording his knees yeah. for a while. And then he just made a movie about it. And it's sort of, that's what I loved about the first one, especially is this sort of uh, tension between him trying to talk about all these science fiction lofty ideas and then this little girl who just says booby blue because she's a four-year-old and she's just crazy and says whatever Mm -hmm. a four-year-old says and i think that's sort of the that's what makes these movies i must admit i also don't fully get it it's just it just feels so unique to uh, find all these grand emotions both from an adult very cerebral adult and from a very you know emotional almost elemental child is how i see it well and it works as a short like if it was a feature film then i would it would be too much yeah absolutely i mean it's so packed with so many things and it's and it's yeah it's perfect for a short a a an achievement i guess in directing uh that you really felt like you were there and the way i kind of thought about dunkirk was back where i grew up in maryland and people would have these uh, these Civil War reenactments. There, there wasn't like a, a narrative, I, except for the battle. It was in, you got to relive, reenact the battle. And I thought that this movie was the closest that I've ever seen to really feeling like a reenactment of a battle. And you really felt like you were there, especially on IMAX, you know, and, and feeling like you were living the 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 battle and the way that he did the time structure was interesting i felt like it was a little bit uh avant-garde for nolan uh Mm -hmm. to try and i appreciated that and i i mean just what he had to do in order to get the shots and to do what he to make it to make it so immersive was very impressive i thought and um so i mean i could have easily given to patty jenkins but you have that third act so I don't know. It's just when it came down to the one that I thought was the most achievement for a director was I think Christopher Nolan and Dunkirk. All right. I also went a similar route for a director. I tried to think of, um, you know, what the achievement, the most impressive sort of directorial achievement for me was. Obviously, I love uh, the movies that I love, and I think all of their directors I could have put in the best director category. Mm-hmm. You know, Greta Gerwig for Lady Bird, or I thought of the Safdie brothers, brothers who did mm-hmm. uh, Gut Time, which is a really, really great sort of thriller adventure, perf- a perfect movie, I think, if you ask me. And also mm-hmm. David Lowery, who did A Ghost Story, which mm-hmm. is a, a movie that I know you've seen, and it's uh, definitely yeah. sort of like a very creative, unique sort of bonkers movie that goes in some directions that are truly um you know daring um ultimately though i felt like the highest degree of difficulty like the movie that i think shouldn't have worked except that this guy sort of did such a great job with it is uh, the florida project directed mm. by sean baker Still and I, seen that. I need to it's great um and as you know, it's this sort of story about this little girl and uh, her mom living in this sort of cheapo motel in Florida, um, outside Orlando. And um, it's basically a movie about this little kid who is a total rascal and she is so loud and annoying and uh, rash, I guess. And just going around um, and living her life. And it shouldn't work, I don't think. Almost no director could have made that work. The child is so, so misbehaved and so loud and so annoying that you really needed a, like a perfect control from the director, like mm. a completely to handle this and to make this movie work the way it does, to be as moving and as touching as it is, even though it is not trying to be, you know, super sentimental. It's not trying to cloy or anything like that. And I think that is very special. And the best actress. And I feel like this year has been a really good year for ensembles. 
but I, I there weren't that many to me actresses that was or actors that were like there was like these juicy acting roles to me like it was all part of like an ensemble I don't know that's how I felt and so I don't know I I already talked about it but I picked Kristen Stewart for a personal shopper I I think she took a a role that uh, didn't have a ton on the page in a way but she added that heart and I mean she managed to make like someone answering texts compelling to me and so I I picked Kristen Stewart great um I was actually, a couple of weeks ago, I went to see uh, Rebel Without a Cause. They were showing it here in New York mm -hmm. and they had never seen it. And watching James Dean's performance in that movie, it made me think of two uh, contemporary actors. One of them was Adam Driver and the other one was Kristen Stewart. Mm -hmm. That's I think, interesting, yeah. Yeah, because I think he had such an almost unique a way of delivering his lines of being in the scene in that movie you can see him he mm -hmm. is just out of a different world from everyone else he just seems so uh, different but in a way that seems real and i think that's what i get when i see Kristen stewart especially in personal shopper i feel like she delivers certain lines in a way that i feel like i don't think i've ever seen a human say something quite this way but it doesn't ring false to me it just yeah feels unique different like she's just almost like bringing something so real about herself to the performance and i think that's a, a excellent choice and i think she gives an excellent performance yeah agreed yeah there's something uh so it's like an enigma almost about it but and she manages to feel very devastating and sad without really crying which i think says something yeah yeah, yeah. it's a great performance so what was your uh, pick? My pick, I also picked uh, someone from my favorite indie film, and this is uh, Rebecca Spence, who is, uh, plays the aunt in Princess Sid. Mm. She's one of the two leads. The other, the uh, younger girl is played by an actress named Jesse Pinnock, who is also great. Um, but Rebecca Spence, again, I was trying to go for something that I felt... Uh, wasn't being talked about, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I obviously, there are performances that I love, like Saoirse Ronan, again, Lady Bird, or Meryl Streep in The Post, which I hope both are going to get Oscar nominated. But Rebecca Spence probably won't. She's in such a small movie, but I think she gives an amazing performance. And she she's a Chicago actress, I think, a theater actress. So we haven't seen a lot of her in movies, but she totally has... I feel like if there's any justice, she should be in, you know, she should be one of those great character actresses like uh, mm -hmm. just pluck her into any movie and she's gonna give you something because she is so tender and uh, just lovely she feels like such a interesting woman that she plays in this movie uh, I don't want to give too much away because you haven't seen it yet but um, the way okay. she, there's a lot of her talking about um, she's a writer who writes about spirituality and sort of uh you know the cosmos i guess i don't know um she has some very lovely conversations with the younger girl in the movie about sort of how she feels about religion and about the afterlife and about life itself and all that sort of things i think it's a lovely performance i think she's a great actress i want to see so much more from her best actor I went with another small performance that I really loved. I went with Kyle Mooney in Brigsby Bear. And oh, I haven't yeah, seen that. You haven't seen it yet? I haven't seen it yet, but I heard it's great. It, I really loved it. I think you would like it. I, I, I think basically like he plays this man who's been um, kept, kept in this uh, bunker by these people and he ends up, it turns out they had, had abducted him. And uh, that's like the very beginning. So it's not a spoiler. And uh, anyway, and so he has to sort of not only come to terms with uh, the whole world, you know, because he's been isolated, but he also has to come to terms with who he thought were his parents and these new parents, his new family, all this stuff that he's having to deal with and it could have been like really cloying very easily but in my opinion there's just like a sweetness and a softness and a uh a kindness to his character that i really loved 
And the movie is just such a lovely movie about how the power of particularly creating movies and art of any kind, how that can like save us and unite us and, uh, and something to, that we can all celebrate together. I just thought he gave such a lovely, sweet um, performance. Great. That movie uh, sounds very interesting. Yeah. And I, I really want to see it. I think, I think you'd like it. So, it- so my pick for best actor is to go along with the Kristen Stewart. My pick is Robert Pattinson mm. in Good Time. Okay. Um, which I just said a couple of minutes ago was a perfect movie and I stand by it. Robert Pattinson stars basically at the, as this sort of, you know, low life guy who is kind of a hustler in New York City. Um, and he is trying to get his brother out of New York into, into a better life. So he decides to rob a bank. Things go bad the brother ends up in the hospital and suddenly he thinks that what he should do is break the brother out of the hospital and get the hell out of there and try to make it happen. Now he's trying to do this in theory because he wants to help his brother, which sounds kind of selfless, but he's also an incredibly selfish character in the sense that he will just not stop and he will go and walk all over everyone who gets in his way just in order to get what he wants and what he wants to accomplish. Mm. So he crosses paths with a lot of people, a lot of people less fortunate than him, and he just sort of takes advantage of them. He gets through it. It's one of those movies that takes place over one night, and it's just like nonstop sort of adrenaline, let's get it, let's, we got to keep going, keep going, and just get to what we have to do. And it's a crazy movie. It's, yeah. uh, once it starts, it never stops, and I think, Pattinson is great in it. He just goes right into it. He's not like trying to, you know, get you to sympathize with the character, trying to get you to feel what he's feeling or anything like that. He's just in it and he just needs to get it. It's sort of like a, just like the movie, it's a performance with no breaks on it. It just, it just keeps going and he's just doing his thing. And I think he does an amazing job. Nothing but good things from people who've seen Good Time, so good choice uh so best supporting actress i chose laurie metcalf in lady bird it's actually my favorite performance of the film i kind of wish the movie was about her in a way (laughs) because i think she's so interesting and yeah and just like i like the fact that she's not just the shrill overbearing mother like she's a really well developed character uh of her you know her frustrations and her uh her you know love for her daughter but her anger in a way at her daughter um and uh and just i don't know she was just really interesting and i thought that she did a great job portraying that character yeah i think that's one of the great things about ladybird that i love is that it's just so uh it's a movie that's so interested in its characters and it's showing them in different lights and to understand their points of view yeah I think when you get an actress like Laurie Metcalf, she's just going to, you know, run away with it. I think she's Mm -hmm. so great in the movie. Yeah. And her letter is just so great in the end, I thought. It was really beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, To talk about is the performance by one Tiffany Haddish in the movie Girls Trip, which I assume you haven't seen. It'd be in a bunch of comedies. (laughs) It's not one of the things that you uh, usually enjoy enjoy and i think uh it probably isn't one of the things that you <laughs> would enjoy if you watched it it's very raunchy um but it's also very good and i think tiffany haddish does an amazing job in it a lot of people it's obviously a hilarious performance um she's super funny in the movie she is truly the runs away with it um and a lot of people are talking about that uh, what a lot of people are not talking about is that she's also sort of the heart of the movie. Um, there is a very telling uh, scene, I think. Uh, I think it's halfway through the movie, maybe, in which the girls that are on this girls' trip um, sort of have a are in their hotel room at night, sort of ready to go to bed or something. And Tiffany Haddish has this moment in which she just sort of... Um, 
you know, uh, takes a moment and she gathers her friends and she decides that she's going to pray that night and she's going to be thankful for her friends and for all her other things, which seems like a very, um, uh, not strange, but it's, it's a little, it's definitely a different tone from the rest of the movie. It's definitely like a, a scene that I thought was a little unexpected. And that I think wouldn't maybe have worked the way it does if it weren't for her abilities and her performance and just how much of a movie star and how charming and how uh, she can command all these emotions and all, you know, as she truly felt like she was a movie star when you watched that movie. You were like, oh, she's going to be big. She has whatever it is that can't be described she has it and I hope that she has a great career ahead of her because I think she does an amazing job in the movie. Cool yeah I've heard uh, that she's the standout from a lot of people of the film. So best supporting actor I went with uh, maybe an unusual pick I went with Bill Nye in Their Finest. Uh, this is a, a sweet little romantic movie it's one of our Dunkirk movies this year there were like five and this is all about they're actually filming like basically like a propaganda film uh to to try to boost morale i mean propaganda is a little strong but a, a film that is sort of commissioned by the government to uh to help uh help boost british morale and it's all about dunkirk and he plays this uh, character that could have been a complete caricature as this sort of foppish silly egotistical actor but he he never lets it go too far i think uh he he keeps the heart of the character and uh he makes it an actual character not just a joke uh but is also very funny and uh so i don't know he was just the one that when i thought about it the one that stood out for me was uh was his performance cool i haven't seen uh their finest even though i hear some people say that it's the best of the Dunkirk movies that we've got this year. Um, so, yeah, I'm looking forward to catching up with that. Yeah, it's cute. It's a cute little movie. For an actor, um, I was trying to steer away from what I thought were going to be the big Oscar players. But for support and actor, I just had to go with the person that seems like it's the front runner at this point and probably going to win. And that's Willem Dafoe in The Florida Project. Oh, okay. Who is uh, simply great. He's obviously a great character actor, been working for a long time, and I'm really happy that it seems like he's going to get to win an Oscar this year, especially for this performance, because it's such a sort of subtle, um, you know, smaller performance, truly just like a supporting role about this guy who's running this hotel, and he just has to put up with his children, and he is driven crazy by all the people living in the hotel, especially the kids, but he just, you know, he also kind of feels for them and he wants to take care of them and protect them in some sort of way. Um, it's a lovely performance. I think he is the heart of that movie. And um, he does a lot with just very little bit silence, with uh, casual conversations, with just a little sigh, a little glance and he just tells you so much about his character i think he does great work and i think it's the sort of performance that i love seeing uh see get a lot of love and respect because it's something that's not easy to do and uh you know yeah. i didn't realize that he was the was the favorite that's that's cool um I think he's a favorite. I'm not a hundred. I mean, it's pretty, it's still early. Um, you know, we haven't even had the Golden Globes yet, but I, it's looking, he's been winning a lot. So I hope, I hope he gets it this year. Cool. Topic is score, best score. And I'm actually going to release tomorrow uh, my video on, on the top scores of the year. It was a pretty strong year. My mm. pick is an anime film. I mentioned it briefly before. Uh, it's called The Silent Voice. And uh, the music in anime has been stellar this year. And this was just beautiful. There's, there's a, a, the main theme. It's called Lit. That's what it's called. And it is mm. just beautiful music. And it's soft. And, uh, but then it can also be big in, in the big moments. But I don't know. I just I, I listen to it all the time. I love it. And uh, so, a silent voice wins for me. Great. Um, 
haven't seen that one. Um, do you know if it's available anywhere? Um, I, it, it, it's not available. Uh, well, the score is available. You can get that, uh -huh. I think, on, on Amazon or whatever. Uh, it, it hasn't been released. Uh, it was in theaters in October, uh, uh -huh. but yeah, it'll be... Uh, It'll probably be sometime in the next couple of months that it'll be available to watch. I, I don't know if you'll love the movie. It's a little, it's, it, I feel like it's a movie that's, that's more for anime fans than for the general public <laughs> because oh, it's, see. it's kind of long and, okay. uh, but, and it's sort of steeped in Japanese, sort of the way they talk and the way that it, I don't know, mm -hmm. but, it, but you might like it cause it's really beautiful and it's a beautiful story uh, is it science fiction? No, it's not science fiction. Okay. It's just, it's just about, uh, it's about this boy who is, uh, who bullies this deaf girl. And, uh, and, and then like six years later, he, he has, he wants to make it right. And so um. they have this, uh, they meet again and they have this sort of relationship, I guess, that is, really touching and beautiful and they're both kind of wounded characters and i love it uh but i understand why it wouldn't be for everybody because like i said it is it's two and a half hours long and uh but anyway yeah i mean i encourage you to give it a shot uh and, and see what you think um but uh but uh but yeah i i thought it was beautiful it's my fourth favorite movie of the year Oh, there we go. Sounds yeah. interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, it does sound a little long, but I think I'll give it a try. I'll definitely yeah. check out that score. Yeah. Um, yeah. I agree with your assessment that this was a good year for scores. Um, I had a bit of a rough time picking just one. So I picked two. Huh? Um, two movies that I thought at the end, I had, so, there's so many great scores this year. Um, good Time, Lost City of Z, among them, I think. Uh, I ended up going with the movies that I thought used their scores most, uh, not most effectively, but, you know, like the movies that got the most mileage are out of the scores, I guess is what I try to say. Mm -hmm. And I think there's no movie that got more mileage out of its score than A Ghost Story this year. Mm -hmm. I feel like yeah. so much of that movie is just, you know, there's no dialogue, there's very little dialogue and it's just following this ghost as he... Uh, wait for something the, the the next thing that's coming the beyond i guess and it's just so so many parts of the movie are just so full of like this sort of very loud but mournful score and that's just blasting and the ghosts and everything that happens it's it's sort of a trip and i think the trip wouldn't be complete without a wonderful score it was written by daniel hart and yeah, I think a ghost story. Yeah, I that's on my list on my video tomorrow. It's beautiful. There's no it doubt about it. Score. Yeah, for sure. Uh, definitely. And my other pick is a movie that I just saw this week, which is Phantom Thread, which has a mm. lovely score by Johnny Greenwood. And, uh, you know, most of his scores that he's done with uh, Paul Thomas Anderson in the past, you will remember There Will Be Blood and that sort of thing. Very loud very abrasive very mm. in your face almost and this time around it's a little different it's a much it's also very unique but it's a very uh, it's a lovelier score it's you know it's a movie about love basically so it's a little softer it's got it it's very beautiful there's like this beautiful piano pieces that he plays and um um, it's just very romantic and very lush. It's something we haven't seen from him before, and I think it's uh, beautifully used in the movie. Next topic is visual effects, and I think that War for the Planet of the Apes probably deserves it because those looked so real, those apes, but I decided to go with something different and maybe a little bit of unconventional choice, and I actually go with Only the Brave, the, the fire in that movie, and it's obviously, it's a story about firefighters, so the fire has to look really good in order to, for the movie to work. And I, I just thought that it looked so real. <laughs> like, it, it looked like they'd actually lit all of this, you know, forest on fire, and, and how they were able to, to pull that off, I, I think, um, was pretty impressive. So that's what I, I went with uh, for visual effects. Great. 
um, heard good things about that movie. Another that I haven't caught up with yet. Yeah, it's solid. It's a good little movie, I think. Yeah. Um, okay, my pick for visual effects is um, the movie Okja, uh, available mm-hmm. on Netflix. And it is this um, sort of co-production between Netflix and South Korean director Bong Joon-ho about this girl and her sort of super pick that is that some nefarious corporation wants to turn into sausage, but the girl is just determined to save uh, her beloved Okja, which is this sort of like weird pig slash hippopotamus creature that lives with her. Mm -hmm. Um, And basically that one character, she's the, you know, CGI sort of creature that is one of the most uh, impressive Uh, visual effects that I have Mm. seen she feels very real completely in the environment like interacting with all these people Um, I think they did an amazing job for a movie that probably didn't have such a big budget most effective CGI characters I have ever seen in a live action film and I think they did an an amazing job with that and it's a really good movie it's uh, among my favorites of the year so I would recommend that it's on Netflix so everyone can watch it who has a subscription Cool. That sounds, uh, that sounds good. Uh, and also Valerian, I think, uh, deserves to be in the, uh, yes. the discussion too. Yes, absolutely. Mm-hmm. Valerian is so, probably my, my number two. Yeah. Yeah. So, all right, next up we have best screenplay. And for this, I went with the big sick. I think that it had such heart. It was funny. It was, uh, you know, we just don't get like compelling romances anymore uh, in the movies and i thought that what i i guess what i was most impressed with was the way that uh he talked about faith in the movie uh and the way that he uh talked about his family and him kind of separating i guess from his faith a little bit and or having that conflict uh that was a, a level or layer to the movie i wasn't expecting and i thought it was really moving and it actually helped me kind of think about some people in my family that have strayed from our faith a little bit Mm. in a little bit different way, which I think that's powerful in a movie when it can do that. And um, I don't know. I just thought it was really, really well executed. And uh, so that's what I pick. Yeah. I think it's a lovely movie um, with a really good script. Mm -hmm. Um, My pick is uh, also another uh, Netflix movie, uh, Mudbound. Mm, This is written by, director D. Rees and Virgil Williams, and it's adapted from a novel. It's basically a story about two families in the South in around the time of World War II, uh, one white family and one black family. Um, each family has one of their sons uh, go off to the war, and then they come back, and uh, things, their tensions, things are different. Um, it's a very, uh, it's a great movie. It is, uh, a sort of, you know, generational epic of the kind that, uh, gets rarely, is rarely made anymore. Mm -hmm. Sort of like this old Hollywood story about families and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And it's coming from a very interesting, uh, perspective point of view. And I think the screenplay has a lot to do with that. That's why I'm singling it out basically the the two guys don't come back from the war until halfway through the movie and that's really when the you know quote-unquote plot of the movie actually kicks in the whole first half of the movie you realize after watching it is almost all set up for what's going to come later and one of the most interesting ways in which they do this setup is there is a lot of narration which is usually i think a sign of weakness in a screenplay but in this script is actually the opposite because you have narration from six different characters at different mm-hmm. moments so you really get to be in each of these characters points of view you get to know a lot about them you get to get you get their backstory and how they feel about things and you spend so much time with each of them for members of both families that you really it just complicates things so much and it makes it everything much more 
just complex and just like, you know, it's not like you are having one feeling at a time anymore. You just get this sort of constellation of all these people and what they, how they relate to each other and to everyone else in the movie. And it's so interesting. Um, so that everything that happens in the second half is so much more, you know, emotional and, and pays off in a bigger way just because you spend so much time with them. And I think that's a virtue of the script. Mm. Cool. Sounds great. Uh, so now we're going to get into our fun ones. So these are some of the more uh, uh, silly ones that we that I we're going to talk about. So the first uh, superlative we're going to talk about is the best duo. And for me, the best duo of the year was uh, Ray and Kylo in oh, the Last Jedi. Steamy. I really, yeah, I really thought I'm a Ray. Uh, Raylo, as they say, I'm a, I'm a shipper. I, yes. I I never would have thought that they would have had such chemistry, such a connection, and I I it's I'm not gonna say it saved the movie because there were other good things about the movie, but it was definitely the most compelling part of the Last Jedi for me was the two of them together. I know we're gonna see them together again in the next one. I'm confident of that, and uh, and. I, I just thought it was like just so palpable the chemistry between yeah. them. I and think what you're trying to say is it was hot. It and was hot. It, it, <laughs> it was, was really hot. It was. And and also like I don't know, there was just an emotional connection too. It was really good. And I think they're setting up for, for what could be a great episode yeah. nine with those two. Agreed. Yeah. Um so you have? I pick. For the best duo comes from a perhaps unlikely uh, movie. It's a documentary called Faces Places or Visage Village in French. It's a French documentary. It's one of my favorites of the year. And it's basically sort of, uh, it's almost like a diary documentary uh, in which this French photographer called JR teams up with, you know, new French new wave legend Agnes Varda who is 88 years old and they just go around France taking pictures of the people that they meet and talking about you know uh, life and uh, sort of all sorts of things it's a lovely movie it's very fun it's sort of like just this hanging out movie about this artist guy and this you know old lady going around France and having little adventures and sort of all that sort of thing. Um, and they're just so charismatic and they're so lovely and they come off as, as just the most, the coolest, most fun people that you're ever going to meet. And I got to say, um, Agnes Varda is definitely the coolest person in the world. I want to be Agnes Varda when I'm older. He's, there's, there, it was just no more delightful duo, in my opinion, than these two in this lovely, lovely movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was great. Cool. Yeah. Uh, I haven't even heard of that. So that's cool. Uh, so the next category is the best kiss. And I didn't really have a whole lot in feature films that I could think of that was like a really epic kiss. Uh, and I love, you know, romantic comedies. I love romances. And so I went outside the box. There were some great kisses on Hallmark. I have the Hallmark Use podcast that I do. And we have so much fun doing that. And they're really... I know people might disagree, but I think they're really championing the, the clean cut old fashioned romantic comedy. And there's a lot of bad ones, but there's some really good ones in there too. And the, the one that I would pick is from a movie called Christmas in Angel Falls. And it has Paul Green, who's very handsome and Rachel Boston, who is just so sweet and wonderful. And she plays, it's kind of a take on the preacher's wife or the bishop's wife the story and she plays this angel who's coming down to give christmas spirit to the town and she meets paul green who's very handsome and uh they just have great chemistry and the ending uh is like they're literally dancing and she was she leans over to him and says i i love you and and uh and then things happen i won't give it a, a spoilers but it's just so good it's a great kiss and uh, it's a great scene. I loved the ending so much. I must have watched it like 30 times. It was so good. And so that one actually would be my favorite of the year. 
nothing in film feature film came close to that for me <laughs> so there you go. great yeah um, great i also went in a little bit of a an orthodox route um i agree with you that the movies you know the feature film movies of the year didn't really have that many you know really good memorable kisses um i feel like you know, Ray and Kylo touching their hands is was a better kiss than most kisses that we've seen at the movies this year. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I decided to go maybe not with the best kiss, but definitely the most memorable kiss, the one that I've thought about the most and perhaps not in a good way. This kiss is from the movie called The Book of Henry, <laughs> in which uh, our little boy Henry is lying on his deathbed. Oh, no. And is visited by your favorite, Rachel, Sarah Silverman, who just lays a really wet one right on his lips. Um, That's definitely hilarious. one of the most what is going on moments of the year. And definitely the kiss that I have sadly had the hardest time pulling out of my memory. <laughs> I love it. That's so funny. Yes. Good choice. People will probably pick the kisses in Call Me By Your Name, but they're so sloppy. <laughs> Which is, it's, if it's the characters, that's good for 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 the for your young character. But yeah, I, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. There's some good kisses um, in Call Me By Your Name. I know there's a, a very sloppy kiss in Lady Bird that I like the the first time she kisses the the theater guy, the first boyfriend. Oh yeah, I yeah. think that was very sweet. The, just like just how you know into it they are yeah like, that's true I, I don't know you might have picked who knows picked the book of henry for biggest laughs but the <laughs> series the biggest laughs but i went with logan lucky i thought it was really funny probably more so than most people because i grew up in the small town in uh, in maryland and I, I just felt like they really captured i also served my mission in indiana so i i sort of know nascar culture and and uh indie, the indie car culture and i know i just thought they nailed it i it made me laugh uh and i thought Anne driver was hilarious in it i thought that channing tatum was really funny i don't know i just really liked it more than most people it seems like great do you have a do you have a particular moment that was you know the funniest in your opinion i mean anything with a uh, um with oh my gosh my brain um anything with daniel craig i just thought was hilarious i but my i i my favorite was probably the uh the um the jail uh thing. yeah There's, um <laughs> when they're asking for the game of thrones book yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. that was so funny <laughs> Yeah, that was really funny. That's what I was thinking, too. Yeah. As soon as you said Logan Lucky, I was like, oh, it's going to be that scene. Yeah, that was really funny. I don't even watch Game of Thrones, but it was so, it was very funny. Yeah. And um, I don't know. I just liked it. I thought it was, I thought it was really good. Yeah, it's a good movie. It's a, uh, I think I should uh, give it a second look, even though I did like it the first mm -hmm. time. Um, um, a lot of people love it. And I feel like it's one of those I mean, movies. I feel that like nobody of, likes it really yeah maybe maybe i'm just um in my weird corner of film twitter or something i i, I feel like i've heard of some people really into it i do oh. think it's one of those movies that can benefit from watching it multiple times though mm -hmm. it's such a hangout sort of movie i feel yeah, um, yeah so. i think so it's just really chill and i uh yeah i just i love adam driver when he's like i love adam driver period but yes. uh but he's so funny he's just a funny guy <laughs> yeah it's a good it's a great cast um all right well my biggest laughs um lots of funny movies this year mm -hmm. i gotta say even if not exactly some of them you know not 100 percent mainstream comedies but lady bird obviously meyerwitz stories is another movie that i thought was hilarious mm -hmm. um the funniest like the most i've laughed at the movies this year and it was rolling on the floor is uh, halfway through a movie called the other side of hope which i saw mm. at the new york film festival there's a heard of that finnish movie uh by a director aki karismaki who's a bit of a art director um he's also 
most known for his style, which is basically the most deadpan comedy that has ever existed. It's not unlike, um, remember when we talked about the 2007 movie and we saw You the Living, Rachel? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, With the sort of zombie Swedish people. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So it's sort of that kind of style of of absolute deadpan comedy. And this movie is basically about a Syrian refugee who escapes to Finland and also about this Finnish guy who gets a divorce or is more like he's kicked out of his house and he sort of starts a new life uh, uh, opening a restaurant and then their their paths sort of cross at some point. Mm. And uh, the scene that I'm thinking of that was hilarious is basically this guy opens this restaurant and he's sort of struggling. So the people that work at the restaurant trying to figure out new ways in which they should attract new people. And one of their ideas is to turn the restaurant to a sushi restaurant. And these are like four guys from Finland who have no business doing any sushi. They don't know anything about it. And the results, like it's just this sequence of this one night in which they're serving sushi to this, I guess, Japanese tourist or something. And it's the most hilarious thing I've ever seen. These dudes have no idea what they're doing. They're just putting like spoon loads of wasabi in every piece of sushi. (laughs) Like it's... (laughs) They run out of fish, so they just like take out some sardines and put that on the sushi. It's it's crazy and it's hilarious. And it's everything is done with such a straight face. Everyone is so serious about it that makes it just even funnier. I was rolling on the floor. It was great. That's cool. I haven't heard of that. That's really cool. Yeah. It's, it's, a very, it. it's a lovely movie. It's uh-huh. it's a great movie. Um very funny, very sweet. Well, the next one is the most rewatchable. And for me, I think the most, I could have also picked this for Biggest Laughs because it was very funny to me. I picked Thor Ragnarok as the most rewatchable. I think I could watch that over and over and over again. I loved Valkyrie. I love, I mean, I have a huge crush on Chris Hemsworth and, and I have a huge crush on Tom Hiddleston. I love Loki and I love Thor. And, <laughs> and I just, I thought it was so funny. I I loved the characters. I just loved the movie. I like Marvel. I'm a, I I enjoy most of their movies, and uh, I don't know. I just really liked it. So yeah, uh, it's definitely loads and loads of fun, um, and kind of a pretty good year for Marvel movies. I think, yeah. at least in my opinion, I'm yeah. usually a little down on them, but I liked Guardians of the Galaxy. I liked. Thor and uh, you know Spider Man was all right, um, you know I'm certainly looking forward to next year. I, I, that Black Panther trailer looks pretty good. Yeah, it really does. It said very. I just it's just the kind of movie that I could just put on in the background and just like enjoy and rewatch. And I don't. I can't picture myself really getting that sick of it. So that's, yeah, that was the one I picked. Great. Uh, my pick um, had a little trouble with this one. Um, I don't usually rewatch movies that often. Um, so it was kind of hard for me to say, like, I usually it should like a year or two should go by before I rewatch a movie. Okay. I can see myself though, watching Lady Bird and Princess Sid many mm-hmm. times throughout my lifetime mm-hmm. and many others of my favorites. Ultimately, I decided to go with the movie that I thought I wouldn't like as much as I do if I hadn't seen it a second time. Ah, okay. And that movie for me is The Lost City of Z, which I really liked the first time, but it's such a, it ends in such a weird place and it's such an open-ended sort of uh, almost spiritual esoteric movie that I, I, I really had to see it a second time already knowing what was going to happen and sort of being familiar with its structure so that I could fully just get lost in it and, and sort of, you know, get the full picture of what was going on and watching it a second time made it one of my favorite movies of the year. I think it's a truly special movie. And uh, I would say everyone who hasn't seen it ought to see it. It's on Amazon prime right now. So, Mm -hmm. and it's a lovely, lovely movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I saw it. I didn't love it like you did, but, uh, but maybe I have to rewatch it. So (laughs) maybe Um, I think there's a lot about it that the first time I was sort of raising my eyebrow that that went down much better the second time. Okay. I just felt like, 
Yeah, I just felt like for me, the people were, weren't talking like real people. Like they were talking in like speeches. They were speeches to each other. And that was what was hard for me. But yeah, maybe yeah. I'll, I'll watch it again. I mean, yeah, I actually felt a little bit of that the first time as well. Um, there's sort of, uh, there's a little bit of stodginess. And I think it has to do with the sort of like the bridge like this rigid society and then the, mm-hmm. the jungle which represents sort of like the other the sublime and i think uh yeah and i think a second move view in just knowing that these people were gonna talk this way did a lot and cool. just to like you know let me surrender to the lost city of z and i'm told the opposite view i'm a re-watcher queen i i i will watch if it's a movie i like I mean, I've seen, I don't even know how many times I've seen Wonder Woman already. I just rewatch, rewatch, rewatch. So, oh, I, and I send it with books. I read um, Jane Austen every year, all five. And uh, I don't know, it's right. funny that way, but um, um, okay. Which one, which is the movie that you've seen the most times this year? You think it's Wonder Woman? Um, no, actually the movie I've seen the most this year was the documentary Step. I loved oh, it so much. Of course. Of course. And, um, but I, and it did get on the short list for documentaries, which is just infuriating to me. I, not even on the short list. Oh, makes me so mad. Tear jerker is the next category. And I, for me, I also would go with a silent voice because uh-huh. it is, has just some devastating scenes in it that, uh, that were, I mean, especially for me that I, I was bullied as a child um, so bad that I had to get taken out of school. And uh, so I really uh, connected with those scenes, of course, and uh, it was just devastating at certain points and beautiful. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I want Silent Voice for Biggest Tearjerker. Interesting. Uh, so Biggest Tearjerker for me, and I got to say, uh, I, la- I mean, I cry at a lot of movies, but usually not at set stuff so this category was a little hard for me you know um usually i feel like when people say tearjerker they're thinking of like you know something that it's really sad like i don't know grave of the fireflies or something right right yeah people say i cry so much and i definitely shed a couple of tears in grave of the fireflies but something that is like happy like a sports movie when the team finally wins at the end that thing will make me cry mm-hmm. like nothing else. Just, just something about happy tears that come to me so easily. Um, I cried a lot of movies this year. I had a hard time with this one. It's the only category which it, in which I haven't picked just one movie. I will just rattle off like the weird titles that I, I cried during The Last Jedi. I cried during Wonder Woman, Faces Places, The Post, Girl Strip, um, <laughs> Logan Lucky. <laughs> Uh, fucking lucky <laughs> yeah well when yeah. he goes to see the girl his his oh, girl yeah, yeah. At the end, then it's so it's such an obvious oh. and that's what i'm trying to say that's such an obvious scene i felt like i could see myself being like rolling my eyes at myself yeah. crying during that scene it was this so <laughs> obvious that they want me to cry at this point but i just can't help it so that's yeah. you know, the sort of thing i'm talking about um obviously if i have to pick something and i'm i'm I just wanted to say all of that just to make yeah. sure people don't think this movie is like a downer or anything um, because Princess Sid is probably the one that I cried at the most, but it's just, those were happy tears is what I'm trying to say. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful movie and it's lovely and don't think that it's going to be a downer when you see yeah. it. I'm also like you, I'm a very easy cry in a movie. I, uh, I will, uh, it, it doesn't take, take much uh, for me to tear up. Uh, but uh, and I could have picked Wonder Woman because that did definitely make me weep. It really did. But uh, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, but you were being true to the tearjerker part yeah. of, the, of the category, yeah. right? Right. So okay. So the last topic is the best date movie, and I think Lady Bird would be a good choice uh, for a date movie for sure. But the one I went with is. 47 meters down which i thought got way too much hate i think a good date is to go to a scary movie that's not like a horror movie this this is pg-13 it's enough that you want to like grab the hand of the person you're with you know and get a little (laughs) like ooh, it's a little scary and and the sharks I, i just thought this was so cool because this was a shark movie that was underwater and you got to see the whole shark like usually it's just the you know the the red fin 
Yeah. And uh, and so it's, it's it's silly. It's a silly movie, but it was fun. I, I thought it was a fun, silly movie, and uh, I I thought they did a good job, like creating atmosphere and tension, and and uh, uh, you know they only have so much of oxygen, and they got to get out of this cage, and you're building tension. And I took my friend, and she really liked it, and I liked it, and and uh, um, I don't know. I think it would be a perfect movie to go on a date with. It's just like the kind of, there's, there's some, there's some jumps, you know, that you want to, like I said, you want to grab the hand of the person you're with and, and, oh, you know, what's going to happen. And there's a big fake out at the end, which was really fun. And, and mm-hmm. uh, so, yeah, that's what I would pick. Um, yeah. A similar uh, choice to that, um, even though it's not exactly my pick for a date movie, but the movie that I was happiest to see with a large audience at a theater was definitely Get Out this year. Oh, yeah. Um, that was so much fun to watch. Um, I was like, I was in a theater in the middle of Manhattan in the Midtown area and people were loving it. Yeah. Uh, and I was loving it too. It's a great movie and a great one to see with the crowd. However, date movie. I have, I think I have the best date movie. This is sadly directed only at... Uh, the the female audience like this pick is for women who are in a relationship with a man or who are going on a date with a man i okay. got the perfect date movie for you take this guy to see sofia coppola's the beguiled oh. and then <laughs> ask them what they thought of it because if they see the movie too much from colin farrell's perspective then you know you shouldn't date this guy <laughs> that is my I like that that is my uh good litmus test yes i think it's a perfect (laughs) litmus test i like that that i didn't love the movie but i like that reasoning that's that's really good uh have you seen the original i have seen the original Um, interesting because i felt like they took the tension of that original particularly with like the backstory of the nicole kidman character which was sort of weird and strange and and like I don't know, having the slave character and having, I know she had her reasons for doing, I just thought that it was, the original was so much more like tense and interesting than mm-hmm. this new one. I don't know. I was kind of disappointed by it, but. Um, I think, uh, I mean, I, I like, I think I like the new one better, even though the original is like you say, very interesting. I think it's just the difference of the, what the directors are interested in. I think you can tell that the, guy who directed the original i forget his name um but he was much more interested in sort of like the pulpy sort of like you say the tension of the whole thing and i think uh sofia coppola is more interested sort of like she is usually in sort of like the mood and the the visuals and that sort of thing so it was a different approach which i think was i thought was interesting it was it's definitely very interesting to see the two back to back and compare them i think that's a cool exercise for anyone who is interested in movies yeah i agree with that i think that's definitely worth doing and uh it's beautifully made so you can't you cannot argue that for sure and so yeah and i like i like that reason for for your for your date so that's good all right well this was really fun i had a great time talking about these uh i did too it was great and (laughs) And so, yeah, I, I feel like this year for me was much stronger than last year. Uh, I know a lot of people don't feel that way, but last year, almost every blockbuster disappointed me. And this year Mm -hmm. I pretty much liked, I I was a little disappointed with Guardians of the Galaxy volume two, and I didn't really like Kong School Island. But aside from that, (laughs) I found things to like in almost all the blockbusters and uh, I don't know. I just, and then there was all these great indies and I guess it was a week year for animation as far as mainstream animation. So that was a bit of a bummer, but, uh, but other than that, I thought it was just a really fun year at the movies. So. I agree. I think it was a fun year as well. And we had some really interesting movies uh, this year. I mean, just the fact that we had such different movies be such big hits, like, you know, Get Out and Wonder Woman and Lady Bird and then Star Wars and I feel like it was pretty varied and and mm-hmm. people just as a whole were talking about very interesting and very different movies this year which yeah. I think is always good. Awesome. Well, if 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 anybody if people listening if you've seen any of these movies we've talked about, uh 
let us let us know and I will include all the categories in the description section so if you guys want to do a video of your picks please do that would be really fun oh. or just put in the comments section your picks uh, that would be great we'd love to hear what you have to say and um, thanks so much for joining me I really appreciate it and absolutely thank you for having me yeah so where can people find you uh, people can find me mostly on Twitter uh, Coco Hits New York is my handle or you can find me at my blog, cocohitsny.wordpress.com. Um, just come by and say hello. Yeah, yeah, definitely follow, follow Conrado. And, uh, and you can find me at Smiling LDS Girl on social media and at 54 Disney Reviews on my blog and here on uh, Rachel's Reviews on iTunes and on YouTube. So thanks again, and we will uh, get together again soon. I hope so. Yes, definitely. Yeah. Great. <laughs>